That's my cue. Welcome to the final part of our lecture series on colonization in North America. So far, we've been in both the northern and southern parts of the continent, and we'll now finish in the middle, the area that will eventually come to be the United States. Once again, a key idea that must be reinforced here is the diversity and expansiveness of societies and groups that lived as Native Americans prior to contact with Europeans. Whether the Inuit in Alaska, the Mohawk in the eastern woodlands, the Sioux in the vast interior plains, or the Puebla in the south, they all had established themselves in traditional areas, and their cultures and lifestyles, as one would expect, were very much influenced by their specific geographic environments. Similar to the experience in Canada, the population density was much lower than was the case in Mesoamerica to the south. Some subsistence societies existed comfortably hunting and gathering, but more sedentary approaches to life were also possible, especially after corn arrived from Mesoamerica as an agricultural crop that enabled more permanent settlement. Such agricultural innovations were embraced to varying degrees depending on their suitability. For the Iroquois, some 80% of their food supplies came from agriculture, with the rest coming from hunting, fishing, and gathering. Iroquois society was very much based on the longhouse. Each house was a home to a number of families and then houses were grouped together as villages. By the time European settlement was beginning in this part of North America, the Iroquois Confederation had been formed, bringing together five distinct nations under one political umbrella. The Confederation proved an effective military alliance against enemies, and is considered by some scholars to be a distinctive example of the emergence of complex political organization beyond Mesoamerica. As I've already said, the Iroquois nations were but one group of Native Americans. It would be impossible to even begin to address them all. Suffice it to say that they, that they were certainly numerous and spread all across this part of the continent. Estimates of total Native population here prior to contact with Europeans varied wildly, anywhere from 2 to 18 million. It's difficult to know definitively, but as we'll see, whatever the number was, was reduced substantially, even catastrophically, with European contact. In what would become the United States, the first permanent settlements were at Plymouth and Jamestown in the early 1600s. Take note that this is happening a century after the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire, and there are not only differences in timing, the settlers arriving on the Atlantic coast encountered a more sparsely populated area. While the Spanish had used indigenous peoples as laborers in mining, the building of cities, and agriculture, the American colonizers assumed a garrison or fortress sort of mentality from the beginning. The early colonialists limited their contact with Native Americans as much as possible, even if long celebrated traditions such as Thanksgiving point to the obvious and critical help they needed from their new neighbors to survive in North America. In this sense, the British were also different from the French in Canada, where interaction with indigenous peoples was critical to their fundamental economic enterprise, the fur trade. The early intermarriage between the French and Aboriginal people and the Spanish and indigenous peoples is not at all as common between British and Native Americans, pointing again to the degree of segregation that was more typical in this colonization. One common factor that facilitated conquest and European colonialism across the continent was disease. Wherever indigenous peoples lived on the continent, European diseases found them, sometimes even before the Europeans arrived themselves. I've already noted the difficulties in knowing precise population figures prior to the arrival of Europeans, but we do know that by 1800, in what is now the United States, there were only about 600,000 Native Americans. This number would decline further over the 19th century, so that by 1890, only a quarter of a million had survived. Measles, chickenpox, and smallpox proved terribly deadly. With no immunity to these illnesses, indigenous peoples were very vulnerable. And there are indications that in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Europeans were willing to take advantage of this vulnerability and deliberately infect blankets traded with Native Americans to accelerate the spread of these diseases. In addition to disease, Warfare would further compromise the health of Native communities. 
King Philip's War, waged in New England from 1675 to 1678, is one of the earliest examples of deadly conflict between settlers and America's indigenous people. Initially, following contact, the Wampanoag people had lived in relative, at times, difficult peace with the English settlers. However, increased pressure on the Wampanoag to sell more and more of their land eventually stretched relations to the breaking point. Their leader, Metacomet, known by the English as King Philip, led his people and their allies in armed resistance to English colonialism. In the end, both sides suffered. The English lost a significant number of men, many new settlements were attacked, and the economy of the area was actually set back years. Native Americans in New England, however, were decimated. Some suggest the population declined by 60 to 80 percent as a consequence of the war. Whatever the number, it proved to be a turning point. After the war, settlement continued and the colonization of New England truly took hold once Native Americans were no longer present in sufficient numbers to effectively resist. In many ways, King Philip's War was an omen of things to come in the following two centuries for Native Americans. As the English colonizers arrived in even greater numbers and consolidated their settlements, they then pressed for expansion to the lands still occupied by Indigenous peoples. Remember from our lecture on Canada that Britain had defeated France in the Seven Years' War, and an important consequence of that victory was the transfer of the French colonial empire in North America to Britain. The British monarch, King George III, then issued the Royal Proclamation of 1763, still an incredibly important and foundational legal document in Canada. For the United States, its historical significance rested in its requirement that settlers should be contained east of the Appalachian Mountains. This was done largely to normalize relations with indigenous peoples and to more thoroughly regulate how the western frontier settlement would unfold. Ultimately, for the rest of American colonists, the boundary limiting and regulating westward expansion simply became yet another reason to revolt against Britain. While Native Americans fought on both sides during the American Revolution, it's perhaps not surprising that many would support the British in hopes that the buffer created by the Royal Proclamation of 1763 would slow down westward colonial expansion. Of course, the British lost in the Revolution and the Royal Proclamation no longer applied in American territory after this. Still, the newly formed United States had to contend with the fact that Britain and Spain remained significant imperial players on the continent. So long as they did, Native Americans could be important allies in the delicate balance of power that had to be maintained. For example, during the War of 1812 between Britain and the United States, First Nations played incredibly important and sometimes decisive roles during battle. After that war ended in 1814, basically in a draw, relations between Britain and the United States were far less tense, and the need to maintain good relations with Native Americans became less important than shifting the American frontier west. Sushi, so good. During the presidency of Andrew Jackson, sushi, the Indian so Removal good. Act of 1830 was so passed good. by Congress and called for negotiations with Native Americans in the South to achieve their removal to territory on the western side of the Mississippi. While removal was supposed to be voluntary, in reality, tremendous pressure was used to get treaties signed. Travel westward to these new territories was difficult. 17,000 members of the Choctaw First Nation from parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana left for the Indian Territory in the West, but thousands died along the way. Cherokee from Georgia suffered a similar fate. Other First Nations, including the Seminole in Florida, actively resisted and were forced westward only after considerable military force was used to shift them. In fact, some Seminole never left, taking up defensive positions in the Everglades and waiting till the Americans simply gave off. From the middle to the end of the 19th century, the United States completed its acquisition of North American territory, extending its reach across the Great Plains to the Pacific Coast. After a short stint as an independent republic, Texas joined the U.S. in 1846. Then, following the Mexican-American War waged from 1846 to 1848, Mexico was forced to give up its claim on much of what is today the American Southwest, California, and beyond. Of course, indigenous peoples lived on these lands 
and many actively resisted the arrival of settlers from the East. But settlement was precisely the agenda of the American government. The idea of manifest destiny had taken hold among Americans, a firm belief or conviction that the United States was destined to take over the continent. The discovery of gold out west just added even more incentive to get there as quickly as possible. Some of the worst and most deadly wars with Native Americans took place in the states along the border with Mexico, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. Here, the Apache and the Navajo peoples proved to be formidable warriors. The famous Geronimo, or Gayakla, as he was known in his native language, was an Apache leader in one of the final military campaigns in this part of North America, involving some 5,000 soldiers in the mid-1880s. Fighting was also fierce on the Great Plains, particularly after the American Civil War. The American army was turned on Native Americans in the West, compelling them to remain on reservations. Under General Philip Sheridan, soldiers often resorted to attacks during winter months when success was more likely. Once food supplies and livestock had been taken, Native Americans could then be relocated to the reservations. So they would deny saying it, that General Sheridan was credited with taking the approach of the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Infamous military engagements also happened in this part of the U.S. At the Battle of Little Bighorn, General George Custer found himself outnumbered and surrounded by the Lakota. It truly was Custer's last stand. And in 1890, American soldiers killed some 300 Lakota, mostly older men, women, and children, in what came to be known as the Wounded Knee Massacre. What is clear from this account of colonialism and indigenous peoples in middle North America is that it followed the pattern now familiar from elsewhere on the continent. To lesser and greater degrees, violence would come to frame the nature of the relationship between European settlers and the original North Americans, especially as colonial settlement took hold and spread in every direction. Land, who occupied it, and who wanted it was key. That's the final part of the lecture for this week. In class, we'll discuss issues raised in the lecture and examine how the ideas raised here relate to the larger themes in our course. We'll see you in class.
is. Uh, originally, she was going to get the ugly bathroom. And that's why she was going to get her own bathroom. But it turns out the ugly bathroom is actually the one that's connected. But it also turns out that the pictures that were on um, online were not updated. So, like, they literally renovated the bathroom. So, even though there's an ugly bathroom, it doesn't really matter. Like, they're all fine. But, uh, but they used to be, like, wooden bathrooms. It looked so scary. 